among other things, is my thesis advisor. So it's great to have him uh, visiting here. So Omer did his graduate work at uh, Trieste at CISA. Uh, he then uh, did a postdoc at Caltech. And most importantly, he was a postdoc here for uh, several years. Uh, and then he uh, moved on to a professor, become a professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where he's been since. And uh, he's best known, I think, for his work on accretion disks and theory of accretion disks, and that's what he's going to tell us about today. Okay, thanks, Shane. Uh, thanks for inviting me back to Toronto, which is the greatest city on the planet. Uh, I'm going to be telling you about some results of recent uh, uh, radiation MHD simulations that we've been doing of uh, uh, turbulence and accretion disks uh, that's uh, relevant to accretion onto compact objects like neutron stars and black holes. Uh, um, and uh, I think we finally addressed some decades old questions in this field. I'm going to uh, tell you about how the physics and these systems really work. Let me begin by just mentioning my collaborators here, uh, in, in particular, Shigeru Kurose, who's uh, the Numero system in this collaboration. So I'm going to be showing you the results of simulations, as I said. And he is the simulation guy. I do not do simulations myself, neither does Julian, neither do my students. Uh, we have the fun role of, uh, of being the data analyst and extracting all the fun physics from these simulations, and he does all that hard work of actually running. Not, not that he doesn't think about his results as well, but he, uh, we really owe a, a lot to him. And, uh, and uh, he's, his productivity has dropped a little bit because of recent events. He's uh, working in Japan right now, but he is uh, in fact okay. Um, I'm going to be. Uh, so as I said, I'm going to be telling you about how we've addressed some decades old problems in accretionist theory. So I'm going to briefly go through that, the, the, uh, the classical theory of how accretionists are supposed to work, especially around black holes. And then I'm going to tell you about what we've learned. And then if there's time, I forgot about the 10 minute uh, delay in the start time, I will tell you about some observational implications. Uh, so I'm sorry, Martin, if I can't get that, that far. Uh, um, I know about the last, it's fine. <laughs> OK. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, so let, let's begin with, uh, th this was a theory that was developed right at the start of, you know, the uh, X-ray uh, astronomy. Uh, and, uh, most types of theory favor. Uh, I'll get to that. <laughs> uh, 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 and the idea is that there's a, a disk of material that's in, in orbit around a black hole, it's very geometrically thin, and material through some form of uh, internal stresses uh, works its way down, spiraling down toward the black hole until it reaches an innermost state, the innermost stable circuit orbit and then plunges into the black hole. These stresses transport angular momentum outwards between fluid elements and that causes material to lose rotational support and slowly drift inward. And it's these stresses uh, that are the heart of the way these things work and you need to understand what these stresses are in order to uh, make progress. And they didn't understand these stresses at the time, um, but you can still make progress. Uh, in particular, if you assume that the disk is in a stationary state, uh, uh, you can use energy and angular momentum conservation laws to deduce that the local flux that's being emitted, assuming that this is optically thick, just scales with the accretion rate of the mass and the radius uh, in this form. And this tells you, this is the basis for why uh, X-ray binaries have invested their power in the X-rays, and AGN and quasars have invested their power in the ultraviolet. Because basically, uh, all of these sources can reach bright eddy to limited states. So this, uh, this accretion rate goes as the mass of the system. This is mass squared divided by mass cubed in the inner state circuit orbit. We have 1 over m. So the temperature goes to the m to the minus 4. And this is the only prediction of accretion disk theory, or post-diction, I guess, which works. Okay? Accretion disk theory basically has not accomplished anything in a predictive fashion since that time. I would argue. Well, what about the disk uh, body system? Uh, if you if you don't put any opacities, real opacities in there, yes, you're fine. If you assume it's really a black body and, and, and don't do any stellar atmosphere modeling, is that fair, Shane? It could be, yeah. And in, a, in the X-ray binaries too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so but let's try and develop it a little bit more. If you want to try and think about variability or disk factor in detail or anything like that, you have to develop the model a little further. And the way this is done is that you divide the disk up into annuli, and you build stellar interior and stellar atmosphere models at every single annulus. And uh, you assume that there's a vertical hydrostatic equilibrium between the tidal gravitational field of black hole and thermal pressure, radiation pressure, and gas pressure. Uh, and you assume that there's some form of heat released, so you know the equivalent to nuclear reactions in stars, which is physics that we understand. 
In this case, it's turbulent dissipation, which is physics that we did not understand at that time. And so you, some, you must assume some spatial distribution of turbulent dissipation, which comes out of nowhere. Uh, and then you have to assume some form of heat transport, which is typically assumed to be radiated through the diffusion, and so that uh, you know, photons diffuse out and carry that heat away. And you build these models in, in that way. Uh, but to understand the, uh, to, to really uh, complete the model, you have to know the mass of each star. You have to know the run of surface mass density with radius. And the only way to do that is you have, is you have to connect this stress, which is doing all the angular momentum transport, to some form of having variable. And this is the fundamental assumption of accretionist theory that was, that was laid out by Shakur and Sinai nearly 40 years ago. Uh, and it basically boils down to this. I mean, they, they tried to make better arguments than this, but it boils down to this. The pressure has the dimensions of force per unit area. Stress has the dimensions of force per unit area. So let's just connect them through some constant of nature Pulled out of them, okay? And that allows you to, to construct models. And, and yes, it is one of the most cited papers of all time. This was, I downloaded this from ADS a couple of days ago. So it's now up to 5,113 citations. It's, I haven't tried to fit this with an exponential. I see that it's flattening off here, so that maybe it's, uh, maybe new uh, physics is finally going to affect this. This is why it's the most cited paper of all time, even though for its time in the 1970s, it was really a classic paper. I, mean, I would claim that there's been very little progress on in understanding black hole accretion disk from the theoretical side since this paper was written. There's been a ton of progress on the observational side. So they're, they're very deserving, but the reason why they have over 5,000 citations is really a reflection of the lack of progress in the field since then for 40 years, okay? And so people are still, Every time we invoke this assumption to build a model, we cite them, okay? Um, and this has serious problems, and it's always had serious problems when, when talking about black hole accretion. And this is the biggest one. So in high luminosity states, where the, um, the inner parts of the accretion flow are actually radiation pressure dominated, you would take this assumption to mean that the stress is proportional to the radiation pressure. Well, so, uh, so, or you know you would take the total thermal pressure because that, that that's surely the only reasonable thing to do. But when it's radiation pressure dominated, you end up with the fact that the, the disk models themselves are unstable. Okay? They're thermally and viscously unstable. Uh, the thermal instability is the one that grows fastest, and so I, I want to briefly go through the physics of how this works here. Uh, so I, I, I take a, a given a, a given patch of the disk, and I want to calculate its cooling rate per unit area. So that's power per unit area. So that's, of course, just going to by the emergent blots. Uh, but if you assume that radiative diffusion is responsible for heat transport, that's equal to the mid-plane radiation energy density times the speed of light just divided by the optical data. In, in the uh, situations that we're considering, the opacity is electron scattering, so this is just a constant. So this whole thing is just proportional to the mid-plane temperature of the fourth power divided by the surface mass density. The surface mass density is, is constant on this thermal time scale, so it, it's, it's actually irrelevant. It's this helical that's it's, it's relevant. Uh, because you can't move mass around on this, on, this rapid, on this rapid thermal time scale. Now, the heating rate per unit area on this patch is, of course, the stress times the rate of strain, that gives a heating rate per unit volume, times the thickness of the disk. The stress is proportional to T to the fourth if your radiation pressure dominated. And the scale by the thickness of the disk, again, because your radiation pressure is supported, uh, the gravitational field, the tidal gravitational field varies linearly with height, so you're just balancing the gravitational acceleration with the flux. So the scale height is just directly proportional to the flux. So that's another t to the fourth over sigma. So that just gives me t to the eighth over sigma. So now if I imagine I perturbatively increase the temperature a little bit, uh, then the heating rate is going to go way up compared to the cooling rate, and I have a thermal runaway. It's that simple. Um, and so this leads to some phenomenology that, let me emphasize, has never been observed. And uh, let me describe this phenomenology to you. So I can do a plot of the thermal equilibrium curve at a given radius in the disk by plotting effective temperature, or equivalently the accretion rate that's going, that's going through there, as a function of surface mass density at that particular radius. And the thermal equilibrium curve looks something like this. The, this is a gas pressure dominated branch, unstable, and then as I increase the temperature, it eventually becomes radiation pressure dominated. And then more recently, people have included the effects of radial advection and have gotten this branch called the sun disk branch. 
This is thermal equilibrium. To the left of this curve, the heating rate is less than the cooling rate. To the right of this curve, the heating rate is greater than the cooling rate. So I imagine I've perturbatively increased the uh, temperature here um, at fixed surface mass density, because I'm doing this on a rapid thermal time, while the heating rate is less than the cooling rate, so it drops back down. If I do that here, the heating rate is greater than the cooling rate, so I run away. So this is unstable, this is stable, this is stable. I should be using this. Um, okay, so now imagine that I have an accretion rate that is fixed by some external supply that happens to try and fix this annulus in this unstable branch. And I start out here. Well, the accretion disk um, it, down here can't, pro can't process the mass that it's being fed because the, the accretion rate down here is much, much less than, the, the, than what it's being fed. So the surface mass density increases and increases and increases on a long, what's, what's called the viscous time scale, until it reaches this point, and it has no choice but to go up here. And so it gets very much, a lot brighter. But now it's processing mass at a greater rate than it's being fed, so its surface mass density drops, it reaches this point, it falls back down. So you get a series of outbursts in this disk, and you don't see that in X-ray binaries, in the inner parts, which are radiation pressure dominant. You do see outbursts that are, that, are in, uh, that are thought to be due to the, uh, a similar sort of S-curve behavior that's associated with a hydrogen ionization, considerably not due to radiation pressure support, that drives soft X-ray transients. And you also, of course, see this in Bork Novi for the same reason, although none of this has ever been well, simulated with magnetic rotational turbulence. Yes, go ahead. Have you seen these doping events, the microplate doping? These, oh, but that's not, that's not this sort of behavior. Not, not on this thermal time scale, or this is time scale. No, that's not. Well, you do see dumping. I mean, dumping into the jets. Yes. Yes. That's due to, that's due to the physics of the, of the hydrogen ionization instability that's uh, driving you from a... I don't want to get into this. Yes, you have a, a, a low hard state that is emitting, that, that has this jet. You have this instability which jacks up the accretion rate, the source gets brighter and brighter and brighter. It starts to go optically thick. There is this, the, the, you cross this jet line as it becomes optically thick and cooler. Yes, you have this outburst, you transition to it into a soft state, and that's not this physics. Those time scales are longer than this. They're months long, and this time, so these time scales would be much, much faster. Okay. There is one source that does exhibit repeated outbursts, quiescent states, outbursts and quiescent states, and I'll ask, answer the question about that. Well, if anyone can know, let me, but let me ask you, uh, uh, yeah. if you just consider the, if you just consider the, Time scales yep. at the outer boundary of the radiation for the dominant. Yes. The outer boundary is not very far, not in an X ray binary. Okay. And we observe, let me, let me emphasize, we observe high soft states in X ray binaries which have very little variability and they last for many, many thermal yes, yes, yes. No, I just, you were saying that you don't see any evidence for strong variations in M dot. No, I don't see any variations with this sort, this this prediction of the theory. Let me be clear. Yeah. I'm not denying that there's variability in X-ray binaries. There's a ton of variability. Um, okay, so um, uh, so people have built alternative models. Okay, and actually not driven by the observations, but just because of the fact that they didn't really like the existence of these instabilities. To be frank. Uh, so, you know, the stress is related to the thermal pressure, so they've chosen, well, maybe in the radiation pressure dominant limits, the magnetic fields and the disk which are responsible for the turbulent stresses, maybe they're limited to the gas pressure for some reasons related to buoyancy. Or, actually, maybe they're related to the geometric mean of radiation pressure and gas pressure, or, or pick any mathematical form that you like and construct your favorite disk model. And this is how bad the field is. Shakurans <laughs> and I were just fine to introduce the stress description, but now since then, literally for 40 years, people have been just playing with <coughs> stress descriptions. And and these are not driven by any physics at all. Well, it's not in part of the arguments that this one magnetic it, pressure it, would be one. Right, right. So Sakamoto and Party, I will give them a little bit of credit for that, but that's it. Yes. And this turns out to be incorrect, this one, so I'll show you later. Okay. So let's uh, Let's get into this now. So, normally when I get to talk on this, I talk about the MRI and magnetic rotational turbulence. I'm going to skip over that because I'm going to assume that you've been exposed to the fact that if, that if you put a weak magnetic field in a differential rotating flow uh, that's conducting, you end up with an instability that gives rise to, to three-dimensional three turbulence. And this turbulence acting in the, in, the, in the presence of this differential rotation does transport angular momentum away 
uh, outward, excuse me, and uh, the, the stresses associated with that angular momentum transport are due to correlated fluctuations in, in, in velocity and magnetic field. Okay, so that's what it really is. And since that discovery, which now is, it, well, this was the, the original paper was in 1991, so it's over 20 years ago, people have been simulating this trends to death, and I'm sure you've seen such simulations. We, in order to address these radiation pressure dominated accretion disks, want to simulate not just the MHD, but also the thermodynamics, the heating due to the turbulence, and the cooling due to the photons diffusing out through the disk and escaping into, into space. And you can't do that yet, even with modern supercomputers and even with modern algorithms. So what we're still, we, we can't do global simulations uh, yet. Uh, so all, what we are forced to do is, is consider a little box that's sitting at some radius in the disk that is co-rotating with the background flow, out and around and around. And there's different, there's shear in this box, and so when we insert a magnetic field, we still develop turbulence. Um, the box has periodic boundary conditions in the, in the azobuthal direction, shearing periodic boundary conditions in the radial direction, so the walls actually do work on the fluid in the box and outflow boundary conditions at the top and the bottom where matter, magnetic fields, and photons can escape. And the box, you, you can see that it's tall and skinny because we really want to get the vertical structure in here. Okay, so the, the, the vertical uh, variations are very highly resolved, much more, much better resolved than in any global simulation of accretion just without the dynamics. Um, and it goes up far enough that the photospheres are actually within the simulation domain, so that's very clear. It's not, we don't resolve the microscopic dissipation scales except for one type of dissipation that's going on in the plasma. We can't because that would require infinite resolution or effectively infinite resolution. So instead, magnetic fields and velocity fields actually are reconnecting at the grid scale here. We capture that energy and we just turn it into heat. Okay, and then that heat get, eventually get, radiates into photons, those photons diffuse out and they escape from the photosphere. So we've got both the dynamics and the thermodynamics of these flows in this box. And that's what you, you need to address these, the questions of what really goes on here. And so what do we see? So these are uh, energies as a function of time for two gas pressure dominated simulations. And I know they're gas pressure dominated because the green curve shows you the total gas internal energy in the box. The red curve shows the total radiation internal energy, 18 to the 4. 18 to the, four. the blue curve shows the magnetic energy, and the black curve shows the turbulent kinetic energy, all as functions of time. And the thermal time, the cooling time, or the Kelvin time here, is around 10 orbits here. So we've run these simulations up to 600 orbits here, 60 thermal times. And, and you can see that the energies are not varying by very much. The total heat energy and the internal energy in the box is, is not varying much time. We've been able to establish turbulence. It's dissipating, it's cooling, it's established a thermal equilibrium, which just sits there long and happy, not doing anything. And this is completely consistent with the standard alpha disk theory. Gas pressure dominated disks should be stable. The interesting thing is though, if you do it in the radiation pressure dominated regime, so now look at this. This, remember, the red curves of the radiation energy is a function of time. These are heavily radiation pressure dominated. We've done these for six simulations with radiation to gas pressure going up as high as 70. This is way in the unstable regime, and we still establish a thermal equilibrium. Albeit with long time scale fluctuations, but still it's, it's basically an equilibrium. So they are thermally stable. And Chris, let me point out to you something. So remember, the green curve is the gas internal energy. Yes. So here, the magnetic energy clearly exceeds the gas internal energy by, by, a, tad. by a tad. And we've now gone up to P rad over P gas of 200. Now even the terminal kinetic energies are exceeding the gas internal energy. There's, the gas internal energy is completely irrelevant. It's not limiting anything in the simulations. Okay. Now, why is it stable? Well, it's presumably because the stress prescription is one of these alternative stress prescriptions. So I can, I can measure that. I can measure the stress in the box. I can divide by various measures of thermal pressure. That's alpha. And do this as a function of the radiation to gas pressure ratio in all the simulations that I just showed you. If I choose that pressure to be total pressure, gas plus radiation pressure, I get these black points here. The error bars show the time variations in the simulation. Yeah. But you can get the very high energy densities. I would yeah. think the gas would tend to pump. So you could compare the local gas pressure. With the oh, that's really a bad idea. 
Shakur and Sunyaya never, never thought that stresses were local in any way. And people who do that, like, that, that really gets my goat up. It's never, it was, uh, it was always meant to be a one-zone model, okay, where you're averaging over and over again. I remember just asking, yeah. what's your definition of the gas pressure? I, uh, is it I, the volume average gas pressure or this, the local gas pressure? Uh, this is the volume average gas pressure. And the radiation pressure and the stress is, is the volume of stress. Is the radiation pressure is much smoother than general in gas. Yes, we'll get into what the what the fluctuations are like because that leads to important physics. I'll get to that. Okay. But it doesn't limit the stress here. It doesn't. I, I wasn't arguing about that. I was just asking what your definition was. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, sorry. These are volume average quantities, that's fine. Okay, so so uh, the, this, these black points are, if I define this as total pressure, these green points are, if I define the thermal pressure as the geometric mean of radiation gas and gas pressure, and the blue points are, if I define the pressures as gas pressure alone. And the curves here are what you would predict if this is the correct description, and then you were just stupidly redefining alpha in terms of the alternative pressures and what you would get as a result. So for example, if, it, if the alpha, so presumably the stress description is the one where over across these radiation pressure to gas pressure ratios, alpha is basically the same, because that tells you how the stress is related to pressure, if this is to mean anything. So if stress is really scaling with total pressure, and you stupidly define alpha as stress, which scales as total pressure, but you're dividing it by gas pressure, then you get this blue curve which skyrockets here, because I'm dividing the same, the, the, um, the, uh, the stress with the gas pressure is becoming an increasingly smaller and smaller component of the pressure, so the stress is going up and up and up at, at, compared to the gas pressure, and so I just get these points here. And that's not what the prescription should be. Presumably, this is the correct description. So, in other words, Shakir and Tsunami were correct. The stress scales with total pressure, but these are thermally stable objects. So, there's something wrong with alpha this theory here. So, the alpha you mentioned. They're more or less all, yeah, I mean, you can see how close they were. Actually, there's an intriguing thing here. You'll notice, so here's unity. This we don't understand. So there are only two points here. So at the time, this was, you know, this is, it's, it's small number statistics, but there's a slightly higher alpha in the gas pressure dominated regime than in the radiation pressure dominated regime. It's constant though, and, it, and we've now done gas pressure dominated simulations which go way out here, and it's still about the same value. You still see this just, it's a little higher here than lower here, but they're otherwise it's more or less the same. You certainly don't get these sorts of predictive variations uh, from the other uh, stress descriptions. <laughs> okay, so why is this? And the answer is so obvious in retrospect that uh, someone should have been able to figure this out without looking at simulations. So. What I'm doing here is I'm showing you a cross-correlation between the time series of, of turbulent, oh, uh, sorry, of energy fluctuations in the turbulence as a, as a function of lag. So it's a cross-correlation uh, between various energies and magnetic energy, uh, and, and then this lag is with respect to magnetic energy fluctuations. So let's look at the black curve. This is the turbulent kinetic energy cross-correlated with the turbulent magnetic energy. And you can see that it's highly correlated, you know, around 85% with zero lag. And that's easily understood because the turbulence consists of both magnetic fluctuations and kinetic energy fluctuations. They're one and the same. So of course, they're highly correlated with zero lag. They are, they are together in turbulence. That's what magnetic rotational turbulence is. But if I do the same thing with the uh, thermal energies, radiation energy and gas and thermal energy, again, you see a high correlation, 75%, okay? But the peak is, is delayed with respect to the magnetic energy by about five to 15 orbits. And that turns out to be comparable to the thermal time within this particular simulation. And that also makes sense. Because where are these fluctuations coming from? They're coming from heating. And what's producing that heating? It's turbulent dissipation. So the turbulence is fluctuating around. It's producing heating. But in order to significantly change these internal energies, which are especially the radiation energy, are much, much larger than the magnetic energy, you have to wait, if you're anywhere near, any, near equilibrium, about a thermal time for those fluctuations to be reflected into the, into the radiation energy fluctuations. So... Wait, should it be thermal time or should it be thermal time? Thermal times, I mean thermal times. That's why you dump the heat whenever you have a thermal Yes, you do. So, but, but, uh, remember... 
Yes, so all of this is the stuff that you're dissipating, and you're dissipating on a very rapid time scale, actually, of order, of order the orbital time. But look at this difference, this, this ratio here. That's basically alpha. You have to wait about the, uh, the, the inverse orbital time, the, sorry, the orbital time divided by alpha in order to get to, that, that, that's the thermal time. And you have to wait about that ratio in order for this pathetic little magnetic energy to produce any significant difference in the radiation energy. Yeah, the thermal content is different. It's huge compared to the turbulent energy content. And you have, that, that's why there's that. that, that but then why would it be any coherence? Well, it is in coherence, as you can see. The, the turbulence is going up and down on rapid time scales, and only if you have a long time scale variation do you get it reflected in the radiation energy. Okay. So it's really integrated heat with the Yes, that's right. So if, if the turbulence energy is going up and up and up for a while, it will eventually get reflected in the, in the radiation energy, which is repeating the gas uh, continually. Right, so this is the correct stress description. But you know, it was introduced so you could calculate stress from something that depended on temperature and density, because you had an equation of state, and you had no way of calculating turbulence back in the 1970s. But in fact, what's happening is that yes, these things are related to each other on time scales longer than the thermal time, but it's simply because pressure is being produced by turbulent dissipation. So people have always thought, so you know, I can perturbatively increase this pressure, but that doesn't produce a perturbative increase in stress. The stress doesn't give a damn about the pressure. The stress is producing the pressure. Okay, so it always goes in this direction. Now, on long time scales, longer than thermal time, these things are correlated. So the alpha prescription works. But not on time scales of order of the thermal time in this thermal instability would like to build. You can't bootstrap up on this instability because this correlation is broken. Okay? You can even model this with some simple differential equations where I have the magnetic energy variation and it's related to some stochastic uh, function which is producing the turbulent fluctuations. This RMT is just a function, a stochastic function with a mean, uh, mean value of unity, which we match to the power spectrum uh, that we measure in the simulations. So times some magnetic, fiducial magnetic energy divided by growth time, which is the order of the orbital time, then divided by, and minus the magnetic energy divided by dissipation time, which is also a order of the orbital time, but there's no radiation energy in here at all. And then the radiation energy is just given, of course, by this magnetic dissipation term minus the cooling term. And you can integrate these differential equations. And when you do, you get this result up here. Okay, this is radiation energy, this is magnetic energy, and this is what we see in the simulations. You see rapid fluctuations in the magnetic energy, which are not reflected in the radiation energy, that it's smoothed out on time scales long, uh, longer than the thermal time, but it's still fluctuating up and down, and it's just responding to what, the, what this turbulent energy is doing. That's all that's going on. Unless you're smart and spotted my little trick, my set of hand here, Chris. There is a little set of hand, gonna, because this is CETA, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you the, the real, uh, I want to show everyone the real Derek here, but there is a mystery that we don't understand this stochastic function I said is just is some is just some random variable which I match to the power spectrum of the turbulent fluctuations, but I said it has a mean of unity. Okay? So it's it's going up and down, but it's always around some mean, okay, which is fixed. And if you look at this turbulent the, the magnetic energy, okay, it's yeah, it's flopping up and down, but it is around some fixed value, which I've imposed here. And in reality, presumably, there's some physics that sets what the average level of magnetic energy is in this simulation. And we don't know what that physics is. So well, could that physics ultimately, maybe on long time scales, be related to how much pressure there is in the box? Well, I don't know. It's not important to gas pressure. This is, why was, this, this is why I was going over this issue. <laughs> We, this is because it's only P right over P gas at 70. Now that we're up to 200, I'll show you. It just gets larger and larger and larger. The gas pressure is irrelevant. But, but the, the gas pressure, I mean, you check the local gas pressure. Though. Yes, you'll see it. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm determined to convince you, Chris. So, so you're, you're my, uh, uh, let's see if I can. Okay, so this is interesting, right? Because now I can do, I can pop this S curve that I showed you before. So this is now vertically integrated stress, which is equivalent to effective temperature, or equivalent to effective accretion rate, as a function of surface mass density. The same curve that I showed you before. Here are the gas-dominated simulations. Now I've included this extra one. 
And this is the prediction of the alpha model. They're spot on, okay, for the fixed value of alpha. And this is the radiation pressure dominated branch, okay? That's the prediction of the alpha, this model. They're spot on. Now, there's no way I could have done this if these simulations were unstable, but they're not unstable. So I can map out this S curve because it's not, in fact, an unstable branch. It's real. So you get the same value of alpha on both the gas pressure dominated Yeah, well, apart from the slight variation that I showed you in the, the, the gas pressure is slightly, uh, the gas, pr gas pressure dominated simulations are slightly higher. Now, there's another, this begs an interesting question. Historically, prior to the discovery of the thermal instability, there were two guys named Leitman and Eardley who noticed that in the radiation pressure dominant branch there was a slower viscous instability, which they recognized from this radial diffusion equation of mass. So this is the just the diffusion equation in the surface mass density, which is given by the vertical given by this partial, these radial derivatives of the vertically integrated stress. Now this is the derivative of the angular momentum, and it's just a fixed function of radius, so it doesn't matter. So all of these are just functions of radius. If I'm, at, if I, if I'm on this thermal equilibrium curve, okay, and I, and I have a positive slope, so dW by d sigma is positive, I can sort of represent this, if you like, as dW by d sigma times sigma. That's a single time derivative, two spatial derivatives. This is a diffusion equation in the surface mass density. With a positive diffusion equation, the, the diffusion coefficient, if this slope is positive, so if I have a, a fluctuation in surface mass density and an enhancement in surface mass density, it just diffuses away. On this branch, the slope is negative, so I have a diffusion equation in surface mass density with a negative diffusion equation, a, a, a negative diffusion coefficient. So if I clump up the mass, it will want to clump up even further. And they realized this in 1974, but then, it, but then people promptly forgot about it because the, the thermal instability was discovered and that was much more rapid growing and so this just went out the window. This physics now appears to be maybe real. And unfortunately, we can't explore it in simulations because there's, this is growth rate as a function of, of, of unstable wavelength. This is the viscous and unstable branch. This is the thermal unstable branch. They're, they have to be two branches of a of uh, uh, two different modes of, uh, of, of instability, um, there's a minimum unstable wavelength, and that turns out to be about uh, four scale heights. And our disk simulations are only half a scale height. We wanted to get this high, really we would want multiple wavelengths to go out here, but because the way, when you have radiated diffusion, the way our simulation time scales with the number of zones, this cannot be done currently. So we can't explore this, we don't know how. Okay, so this is a, it's a, uh, it's TBD. Okay, so I'm gonna quickly show you some other things. This is a very complicated graph of the dissipation profile as a function of height. So we have turbulence, it's dissipating, so we can now measure the spatial distribution of those effective nuclear reactions, if you like. There are lots of contributions. There's grid scale magnetic energy loss, grid scale kinetic energy loss. There's rating of damping of fluctuations. These two things are grid scale. This is real. There are fluctuations in temperature, which because of photon diffusion damp out. This dissipation mechanism amounts to some tens of percent of the total dissipation in the, in the box. So we are physically capturing with real physics, not mocking it up, some tens of percent of the total dissipation going on in the box. Okay. But notice this. It's um, the, the, this, these dissipation profiles peak at about a scale height off the midplane. And out here, at four scale heights, well above the photospheres, which are out here, there's negligible dissipation. Okay? So these accretion disks have no local X-ray coronae. They are energetically significant. There are magnetic fields up there, but they're to, energetically they're just completely, completely irrelevant. So I claim that this is a victory because in the high soft state of many X-ray binaries, there's no significant hard X-ray emission. Okay? And if every accretion disk did this, had a hard, a powerful corona, you, you, that would that would not happen, but there aren't any local generated coronal here. This oh. is a match to the high self state. There yes, is no. some between 10% of the high self state. Oh, oh. Total? Yeah. Even in the extreme high self state, you don't see X3? Maybe there is 5%. Okay, that's more than we're getting here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. How is that dissipation transported outwards? It is indeed transported outwards by radiation diffusion, so this is various energy fluxes as a function of height. So diffusion dominates, dominates, dominates. Well, it dominates until you get to very high levels of radiation pressure support, 
And then there's this other transport mechanism, which we're calling radiation advection. It's the total radiation energy density times the ver vertical velocity horizontally averaged at every high. And it's now becoming comparable to, to radiation diffusion. Okay, so that means that there's something continuously flowing out. There's something uh, falling out on average, on average. There's no mass loss there, so it must, it must form some sort of circulation pattern. So I really shouldn't be calling this advection arm, I should be calling it convection, right? Except that when you look at the profile of what we call the front by solid frequencies, or the entropy profile, if you like, these are very, very stable stratified systems. Okay? Even when you include magnetic effects, so proper instability criteria, in the midplane regions, these are very stable stratified. In the surface layers, they're magnetically unstable, and you have evidence of parking stories going like crazy in the surface layers. But in these regions where radiation advection is important, it's completely stable stratified, so it's ain't convection. So there's something else going on. And, okay, so now, Chris, I'm going to show you some of the 3D structure. When I, uh, forgive me, I'm not a simulator, so I don't make good movies, but these are the movies that I've made myself, so they're pretty pathetic, they're not really beautiful, but, uh, but they show the physics, nevertheless. Yes. So you actually do the uh, yeah. Um, yes. So is the condition aid electricity actually um, uh, a good, good condition? Because if you have a uh, very predominant thermal be very rapid. And, and indeed, it is pretty rapid here, that's true. Um, so let me show you that. So this is the this is the standard diabetic front. This is the magnetic the a diabetic front with the magnetic effects. And this thing is exactly what you said. This is the front uh, taking into account rapid radiation. If the diffusion was infinitely rapid, right. this would be the front. It turns out that you transition on the scales of interest between rapid radiated diffusion and effectively slow rated diffusion at about here. Right. So inside of that it's slow diffusion, outside of that it's rapid diffusion. Even in here, though, even if the diffusion was infinitely rapid, the front is, 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 is uh, the spread of the front is more stable spread of And the reason is simple. When you, um, uh, when the diffusion is rapid, basically you lose all the buoyancy in the fluid. It, it's, it's neutrally buoyant. Yeah. And so what's driving buoyancy here is actually outward magnetic pressure gradients. And it turns out that the magnetic pressure increases outward here and then decreases. So right where you see this change, that's the peak in the magnetic pressure. So you're stable stratified magnetically. And neutrally, if they, if they were no magnetic as well. Uh, oh, sorry. So I'm going to start. You have to, there's something crazy going on, and you have to look at the three dimensional structure within this. So this is a slice of the mid plane. So this is azimuth radius here. And I'm showing you total pressure. And by total pressure, I mean gas plus radiation plus magnetic. They're all combined. And when you run a movie of this, you should easily see some phenomenon here. Uh, and these are just waves. They're shearing acoustic waves that, that, that basically transition from leading to trailing over and over and over again in the box, wrapping around themselves over and over again. And uh, you, can do, you can actually pour your analyze this and see these individual shearing waves pop out easily. But all these are shearing waves, okay? And they're pretty strong. This is responsible for a lot of the radiative damping that we see in, that we measure in the turbulence. This is the same movie, same midplane slice, but now I'm just showing you density, mass density. Okay, so I said that these were acoustic waves, so you should see these these uh, 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 acoustic waves again. And you see them? I'm hoping you can. Not so hard to see it. This they're they're hard to see at this epoch. Let me start this, let me, uh, start this again. Okay, they're rapid, very rapid. You see these rapid fluctuations that are zipping across here. Those are the acoustic waves. But the density here is being dominated, obviously, by something that's much much slower going on. These turn out to be roughly isobaric slow mode fluctuations that are associated with the turbulence itself. And the density fluctuations we're talking about, yes, because they're the density, density minus the average, course, all the average density uh, as a, uh, a fraction of the average density goes up to 60% here. Okay. So they're very, very large. So here's a snapshot at, at one epoch where the, the acoustic waves reach maximum amplitude. This is the total pressure, okay, so these acoustic waves are bouncing back and forth. 
The pressure is dominated by radiation pressure, and you can see the acoustic wave pattern there, except there are slices through here, and that's because in localized regions, the magnetic pressure is gigantic, okay? Gigantic, so much so that the transfers, horizontal magnetic forces, are as large as horizontal radiation pressure forces. The magnetic field is dynamically important here. And these highly magnetized regions turn out to be correlated with low density regions. They're highly magnetized and they're low density, so they're going to be buoyant, okay? Uh, and they're, they're, they're associated with you know, negative radiation energy density fluctuations. Those buoyant regions are what transport photons outward and, and produce this radiation induction. And you can see this in this plot because this is the, um, the, uh, the contribution to the overall radiation induction due to fluctuations of fixed magnetic pressure perturbation and fixed density perturbation. So lower than average densities, higher than average magnetic fields produce outward radiation induction, that's warm colors. Higher than average densities and, and lower than average magnetic field produces inward radiation induction. So we have this circulation that's being driven by finite amplitude fluctuations in the turbulence. This is not a linear instability that you associate with the Schwarzschild criterion of convection. These are finite amplitude fluctuations within the turbulence, which are then buoyant and carry photons out with them. And that's a significant part of the heat transfer. If you do a smoothing of, the, of this outward, so I, I'm not going to horizontally average this radiation induction, outward radiation induction, and plot it as a function of height and time, smoothed over uh, orbital time scales because there are other fluctuations going on that are not relevant here that just confuse the picture. You see remnants of that in these striations. And compare that with the same space time diagram of pointing plots as a function of height and time. You, see, you clearly see outward radiation induction going away from the midplane that is highly correlated with pointing flux going out away from the midplane. So again, it's these magnetic fluctuations that are carrying the energy out. The magnetic, the toroidal magnetic field, by the way, here is flipping back and forth every single cycle here. There's a dynamo that's going on in this turbulence. And this dynamo produces locally, local concentrations of field, which then transport a lot of energy outward. This, I'm going to make this bold claim, and tell me if I'm wrong. This is the first time that I know of anywhere in the universe where a dynamo is responsible for heat transport, and therefore responsible, really engaged with the energetics of the system. Normally, a dynamo is just a consequence of some other form of, uh, so in the Earth, in the Sun, even in proto-neutron stars, which ultimately produce magnetars, it's convection that's building up the magnetic field, but the convection is not being driven by the magnetic field. It has nothing to do with the dynamo. The dynamo is a consequence of the energetics of the system. Here, the dynamo is responsible for the energetics of the system. It's actually producing the outward heat transport here. Okay, so this is what this is due. Do I have time to talk about some observation implications? So I'm going to tell, tell you about X-ray binaries a little bit and, and, and these problems that we don't get this corona. So, uh, forgive me, Mark, because you already know this, but um, it, in black hole X-ray binaries, I'm not going to talk about neutron star X-ray binaries, so you can't really tell me anymore. <laughs> uh, the accretion flow state, if you, if you, if you measure uh, X-ray uh, photon spectra and measure X-ray variability too, there are these, the accretion flow that you observe comes in three different variability, uh, spectral variability states. A state where in the X-ray spectrum, there's a clear thermal component. Okay, so you're telling me that 5%? Okay, but they exist. Okay, so it's dominated by this thermal component. So it looks like a, you know, a quasi-black body. And that is almost certainly um, due to uh, the classical accretion disk. That's what everyone believes. This is called a high soft state. It's a geometrically thin, optically thick accretion disk that goes all the way down somewhere around the ISCO. That's unclear. And it emits locally somewhat like a black body. Really, you have to do a spectral calculation. There are modifications in black body. But anyway, it's, it's more or less thermal, and, and that's the signal. We understand that it's very little thrown, and this is what our simulations, I think, describe. Okay. Yes. So, so what is the energy you find up above the photos? I haven't actually integrated it. I should do that. I will do that. Yeah. It's well, small. It, it, is, it is interesting. It can't explain this, and it can't it, explain It is that. interesting that you would have a significant contribution to the great vertical planetary transfer by the points. It's not seeing much signature of the photosphere. 
Yeah. And I was finding, you know, 10, 15 years ago, to do something very similar to what they're If this had continued, yeah. by the way, this blue curve is the pointing class. There's dissipation of both magnetic energy and the, the energy that you carry by radiated radiation induction. These, these elements arise and then radiative diffusion, because they're becoming less optically thick, starts dissipating all of that. So you lift it out and then you deposit it below the photosphere. But yes, do go on, Chris. I interrupt you. No, 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 no. Go on. Okay. Uh, okay. There's uh, something called the hard state, uh, which is generic at low velocities and even persist at high velocities, depending on the Edmonton rate or some uh, percent of the Eddington rate, uh, where instead of this thermal component, you're dominated by this hard power law, which in nu f nu is basically flat up to about 100 kilovolts, where there's observed, typically observed to be a thermal power law. That's believed by many, but not all, this is controversial, that this is a disk which truncates into something like an optically thin advection-dominated accretion flow, which always has an outflow associated with it. Okay, that's absurd. And then there's this mysterious intermediate state called the steep parallel state, or very high state, or indeed the intermediate state, which is a hybrid of these two in a way. This parallel isn't flat in UF new, it's, it's steeply declining, and it actually extends well above 100 kilovolts, even uh, to any and beyond, suggesting non thermal electrons that are responsible for this. For this. Um, and, but the well electric power is still, uh, there's still a substantial contribution from the thermal component. And there are, somewhat weak observational uh, pieces of evidence that suggest that this, at least sometimes, is associated with a locally generated corona, which is sucking a significant fraction of the accretion power out of a, of a disk that's, that is sandwiched. And I can talk about that, about the evidence for that uh, later, but uh, I don't have time right now. So this system is, is viewed by many, as, by, by many theorists, not by many observers who think that they're all obsessing about the wrong thing. It's one of the most interesting state because they, the, the, the steep parallel state exhibits these high frequency QPOs, which are, you know, pretty pathetic little features in the power spectra that nevertheless occur at stable frequencies in, in the black hole case. They don't move around. They occur in pairs, which are in a three to two ratio. So this is one source, 300, 450. This is another source of around 180, 276. Another source of 165, 241. Some sources only exhibit one. Some exhibit two pairs of QPOs. Just ignore the, the man behind the curtain and just focus on these, uh, which is what most of us do. Uh, but that's dangerous. And 1915 is so crazy anyway. That that would be like, you know, we, yeah, that's a weird system. Uh, but anyway, these frequencies are comparable to orbital frequencies near the black hole. They're stable, so they so it suggests that they involve uh, they're, they're, they are in some sense influenced by the black hole space time itself. And if you knew both the mass and the spin, uh, you could, uh, and you knew what was causing these QPOs, or better yet, if you knew what was causing these QPOs, you could presumably measure these frequencies, use these frequencies to determine the mass and the spin of the, of the black hole. But we don't know what causes them. Uh, and we don't even know what the state is. Uh, okay, so here's a, an approach to trying to tackle this problem, because you know, now that I, I claim that we're starting to understand the physics of these flows, you can start thinking about what it might mean. So first of all, let me take this seriously, this S-curve seriously. Let me really pretend that this branch is really stable. I said that it is probably viscously unstable, but I don't know that. I bet if one day we eventually simulate a global disk and allow that, I bet the MRI of the turbulence does something subtle, and this, this is also a fiction. Okay, so I'm going to take, I'm going to adopt that tack for a second, because the turbulence already turned out to be a fiction. And look how weird it is. As I increase the accretion rate, okay, as I get brighter, I shut more mass down the black hole, the disk is actually becoming more tenuous because the surface density drops. It also becomes more tenuous as you move inward in radius. Okay, so the, the most, it's most tenuous and nearest the black hole as I try and shovel more and more mass in. So take that seriously for a second. Remember I showed you these dissipation profiles? I get negligible energy out in the corona. But these dissipation profiles have near the midplane, but off the midplane, and that's tied to the scale height. As I jack up the luminosity, jack up the accretion rate, that scale height increases, but at the same time, the disk is becoming more tenuous, so the photospheres move inward from here. So I'm imagining, as you jack up the luminosity, the photospheres are going to move inward, and then they're going to start getting more dissipation outside of the photospheres, and you're going to start producing a locally generated corona. And now, the kicker is, and this is 
this is probably the, the most, this, this idea probably doesn't work, but I just want to point this out. This is a power spectrum of vertical velocity fluctuations as a function of height and frequency, okay, in, in one of our simulations. And you can see, and the, the power is being plotted on a logarithmic scale, so it goes over from 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 14. So this is 11 decades of, of range of power. In the outer layers, you see enormous power in vertical velocity fluctuations, and that's because these outer layers are magnetically supported and they're proper unstable. So there's a lot of broadband noise here in the outer layers of these simulations. But in the mid-plane regions where the turbulence is, it's surprisingly quiet, and I mean really quiet, orders of magnitude quiet, except for these discrete features, which just turn out to be vertical standing waves that are sitting in the box. And there's a whole hierarchy of them. This is vertical velocity. This is one which has no node. This has one node here. This has two nodes, one, two, three nodes. And then you can see it sort of gets blurry. But there's a whole hierarchy of nodes with just increasing numbers of nodes, which go up in frequency, of course. This mode, with no node, is literally bodily lifting the entire center of mass of the fluid up and down. And it's oscillating at the local vertical epicyclic frequency, which because we're using Newtonian gravity is degenerate with local frequency. This mode here is a breathing mode. It's going out in, out in, and then they're higher and higher order acoustic rates. And it just turns out, and I'll skip to the map here, the ratio of the frequencies of the breathing mode to the epicyclic mode is the square root of the adiabatic index of a radiation pressure dominated gas, four thirds, plus one, so it's the square root of seven thirds, independent of the vertical structure of the medium. Completely independent. So I have, I could have the vertical structure completely wrong, and I would still have this frequency ratio. And the square root of seven thirds is 1.53. I just find this cute. It probably doesn't work, but uh, so I'm suggesting that as you jack up the accretion rate here, this isn't the way actually binaries work. Actually, they they go the other direction. But imagine you're jacking up the accretion rate. The inner regions of this disk become increasingly tenuous. The photosphere is moving through the dissipation profile you start seeing a corona generated, and at exactly the same time, the photospheres have moved inward, where you're starting to see these modes of oscillation as well. It just happened to be in a three to two ratio. If you can do this over a sufficiently narrow range of radii, so the vertical epicyclic frequency, the, verti the radial variation of the vertical epicyclic frequency is not a problem in decomparing those modes. So that's an idea that, that we're considering, a number of other ideas. Okay, I've gone over by five so, 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 so vertical mode, the yeah. mode, and down mode, there's that, 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 and the breathing mode, the one that's higher. That's right. Yeah. That's the and that actually agrees, I find, with some phenomenology, maybe. But I, I'm already funded several times. Uh, our highest radiation pressure level simulation so far, we're starting to get a significant departure of gas temperature with radiation temperature. We're starting to see this problem of that. The dissipation is, is happening. Okay, so I'm over time, so I'll just summarize my conclusions and stuff there. I'm sorry for going over time. So they're sitting inside regions of higher than average gas density. Look like. But the gas in, is inside them, it's lower than average. Inside them, outside, outside them, it's higher, higher than average. Right, What's right. the pressure balance across the transition from magnetic pressure? It's it's basically isobaric. So if you yeah, if, yeah I uh, I have a so I locally have a that. locally yeah. the magnetic pressure and the gas pressure are comparable. No, no, no. The gas pressure is negligible. No, 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 no. no. Locally, uh, from one one zone to the next. There's the no, 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 it's a balance between radiation pressure and magnetic pressure. The gas pressure is negligible. Negligible. Oh, okay. yeah. But in these neighboring gas, having average gas density zones, the gas pressure is small compared with the radiation pressure that they sandwich. Yeah, the gas the pressure is small. Magnetic pressure, magnetic pressure right. that they, they sandwich. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, gas, I, I, I am convinced that the gas pressure is completely irrelevant here, Chris. Really irrelevant. Uh, in contrast to what people might have been thinking. Yeah, yeah, my name is Anna on your comment about getting the um, radiative energy air factored out. In yeah. the simulation, um, as you go up vertically to the scale height, you yeah. actually have a photosphere in your simulation, you think? Yeah, and the photo, it's in the simulation. The photo, here, the photosphere is at about two and a half. Two and a half. And that's the boundary condition where the magnetic where the, um, radiation pressure goes to zero beyond that. No, the radiation pressure doesn't go to zero. It, 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 
it basically becomes a constant outside of that region because you're just you're just taking that radiation energy that's being transported over to the speed of light, like, more or less. Yeah. And that's why you have to be way further than the plateau, that plateau and the other region. That's right, where it levels yeah. off. That's right. Yeah. That's where you basically reach the photosphere. Well, basically, yeah. And you do the whole thing. Um, how do you do it? Do you do the explicit code, or how, the, how do you get around time field? It's it's an explicit code for the MHD. It's uh, an implicit code as far as the um, so it's FLD, it's approximate diffusion. It's really baby radiation transport, and uh, that's handled implicitly. And implicitly, actually, yeah. So you later the transport can be get infinite wave as well. Yes, that's right. Yeah, and then it's still be stable. That doesn't mean we're doing it accurately. I would not trust our radiation transport, at, you know, above the photosphere. That's FLD is completely in our range, and we see huge depth of fluctuations up there. So shattering all of that stuff could be happening. That's very, very badly treated up there. And then the, at the end of the day, this convection is what's called advection, what you're going to call it. Yeah. So you think of as being driven by magnetic buoyancy, what you're putting in. Yes, a finite amplitude fluctuations in this three dimensional structure. Yeah. Localized concentrations of field, which are buoyant. Which is akin to what Weissach, Lauder, and Farnini suggested that the stresses would be limited to the gas pressure, but that turns out not to be true. They're happily sitting there and they're happily buoyant. Why should the stress um, care about radiation pressure? Oh, I know why I know why the stress is related to radiation pressure, because stress dissipates and produces pressure, produces heat. So I can so see why. Right. Yeah. But then your, your radiation pressure is in the background. That's right, because so it's just all the heat. Right. Right. So but 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 I, I I'm not claiming that the stress cares about the radiation pressure. I'm claiming that the radiation pressure cares about the stress. And that's why the two end up being locked together. However, there is this mystery that, as you just pointed out, why should alpha be roughly constant through all these simulations? And why, is the magnet, why isn't the turbulence just stochastically going off into never never land? What is setting the, the saturation level of the turbulence? Deep mystery. That's unanswered. And it might have something to do with pressure. But it doesn't have anything to do with pressure on the thermal time scale, because we've shown that the, there's, a, there's a time lag between pressure fluctuations and turbulent fluctuations on the thermal time scale. That the, 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 the pressure fluctuations are definitely responding to the turbulent fluctuations. There is a lag, and that's, that's measured. So on those short time scales, the turbulence really doesn't care about the pressure at all. The stress depends on, for example, the uh, no, the Reynolds stress depends on velocity fluctuations. So uh, oh, well, do you think they're limited by? Mm. So in our highest, again, gas pressure is irrelevant. Our highest level simulations right now have turbulent velocities which are supersonic with respect to the gas pressure. They're, they're there. They're fine. They're subsonic with respect to the total sound speed, which is set by radiation pressure. They're supersonic with respect to the gas pressure. Perfectly fine. Yeah, believe it or not. Yeah. So most of the stress is provided by the speeds of very high magnetic pressure. Yeah, it turns out that half the overall magnetic energy is in uh, is basically in regions where the magnetic energy is more than twice the average magnetic energy. It's sometimes about as much as ten times the average magnetic energy. So yeah, the, these aren't flux tubes, but they are dense concentrations of field that come down. And so yeah, and the tail to the magnetic pressure distribution is, yeah. is more extended than the tail of the gas pressure distribution. Uh, 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 well, yeah, in terms of high pressures, but I mean, again, here's the, tail, the high tail of the magnetic pressure distribution, which yes. corresponds to the low regions of radiation pressure, because it's isobaric. Yes. Uh, so the, you know, this is, uh, these are all scattered with the total, uh, pressure average, so I have 7% fluctuations in the radiation pressure uh, scale by the total pressure. I have 50% fluctuations in the magnetic pressure scale with respect to the total pressure. Much, much larger. And so relative to the magnetic pressure, these are huge. Relative to the radiation pressure, that, that, this is mostly radiation pressure, this is small. On the high end, but on the low end, they're, 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 they're matched. But that's because these are magnetic pressure overall. And look at the gas pressure. It's very, 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 very,
Commerce 